Hello and welcome to this podcast introduction to today's program, Ken Burns and the Buffalo Documentary. I was a Jefferson pretender, my first character, and I had the chance to perform around the country for the 250th birthday of Jefferson in 1983. One of Ken Burns' producers was at an event I did at the Opera House in San Francisco, along with a number of other people, including the great Gary Wills of Northwestern. She encouraged Ken Burns to include me in the Jefferson documentary, which he did. I was a historical advisor. That's where I first met my friend Joseph Ellis a long time ago, 1996 and 1997. We've been friends ever since, and, and never more so than now. So I, I went to Walpole, uh, where Ken Burns uh, lives and works, and was interviewed. I was a nervous wreck, of course. I was a big figure in that film, and then I was in the National Parks, and I got to play a really important role in that one. And then I was in Theodore Roosevelt, and then I was in Benjamin Franklin, and that's the only one I've ever studied for, trained for, now in the Buffalo film, and I think in a small way at least in his film on the American Revolution, which is coming out in 2026. I've been so fortunate that he's called upon me in this way and fighting above my weight, because Ken Burns can call absolutely anybody and interview them, and I, that he's allowed me to be in his films um, is really one of the great, one of the deepest satisfactions of my whole life and career. I have, you know, essentially unlimited respect for Ken Burns, as, which is obvious. Um, you know, he's America's documentary filmmaker. Now I'm waiting to see, you know, how much I'm in the Bison film. Not much, I'm thinking, but some people have who've seen it have said that I'm a significant talking head in it. I'm in the 30-second trailer, so that's good news. Um, it means I'm in it somewhere. But you never know until you actually see the film, so I'll be watching on October 16th and 17th and um, eager to see if I am a credit to my life in the humanities or just a, uh, you know, just a slot A, slot C, slot D. Anyway, so David Horton, who's a frequent guest host on this program, he's an administrator at uh, Radford University. He's much interested in the future of, of pedagogy, but also AI, artificial intelligence. He is host, and he asked me a whole series of questions about my own interest in the Buffalo. The best way to see Buffalo in North Dakota is to go out to one of the two units north or south of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And in fact, I'm leaving first thing in the morning to go to TR National Park, the north unit, to spend part of the weekend there in the Airstream. Jane, no, I'm still learning my my ways with it. So I'm excited about that, and I, and I know that I'll see Buffalo. They may walk through the campground, uh, which would be typical and, and kind of wonderful. They're, they're placid creatures. They're not like grizzly bears where, you know, they might just attack you. A buffalo is not going to attack you unless it feels threatened, and the way not to threaten it is to stay away from it. But as you know, every year <laughs> some people get gored and tossed uh, in Yellowstone and, and elsewhere. So this is like a keystone creature, you know, in a sense, if you think, well, how well is the idea of America holding up? Or as Wallace Stegner put it, we need to develop a society to match the scenery, uh, you know, a republic that's as majestic as Yosemite and, and Glacier and Mount Rainier and Devil's Tower. We need to develop a society that's equal to the primordial magnificence of North America. We haven't done a bad job because we have 58 national parks and hundreds of national monuments and more coming in the Biden administration. So it's good news, but it's not all good news. There's intense pressure on the national parks. Rare earths are being discovered all over the place now, and they're, of course, huge in the world of AI. There's always pressure from economic interests, gold mining, the cattle industry, copper mining, other forms of mines, coal, hunting. You know, interests want to either eliminate the national parks or open the national parks and monuments to other types of economic activity. Thank goodness we've held the line, but I don't think that the, the settlement, if you just sort of took a snapshot of all the national parks, national monuments, national forests, national game preserves, national wildlife refuges, state parks, county parks, uh, Etc. If you took a snapshot of that and said that, look at how look at that great extraordinary achievement for America. Keep in mind that there's pressure in almost every one of them to eliminate them or to privatize parts of them or to allow a, a range of economic exploitative activities in them. And so, as Jefferson likes to say, it takes eternal vigilance to maintain what we have achieved through such struggle over such a long period of time. So we talk about working with Ken Burns, which is always a great joy. We talk about the buffalo, my own interest, about a particular interest of mine, William Hornaday, the man who helped to save the buffalo and 
produced a, a famous bison set in a glass box uh, diorama in uh, the Smithsonian. At the same time that Roosevelt was tooling around the badlands of North Dakota, they didn't meet out here. Hornaday was near Miles City, Montana. Roosevelt was here, but Roosevelt went to Miles City a couple of times during that period. They never met. Hornaday was out from Washington to, to get a set, uh, to kill a, a number of bison and, and to be able to produce this magnificent diorama. They eventually did meet at the National Museum at the Smithsonian, and they became allies, and Roosevelt helped Hornaday save the buffalo. It's a, it's a great and inspiring story. Native Americans played a role, too, but not a, not a huge role because they were uh, without money and without power, uh, without agency, uh, just tried to hang on to survive during this period. And so they weren't in a, in a position to to do much, but they did a significant amount, and that's important. After the program, we kept talking about my own experiences with Buffalo in the West and the creation of the mythology of Manifest Destiny and the work of Theodore Roosevelt and Frederick Remington and Owen Wister, three friends, essentially to create the myth of the cowboy West. Owen Wister, who was part of Roosevelt's tennis cabinet, actually dedicated the Virginian to Roosevelt and placed a chapter in Medora in it, Medora, North Dakota, in the Badlands, where Roosevelt's old stomping grounds, really just to please Theodore Roosevelt, his friend. So all sorts of interesting material here. I'm just going to stop here, and we're going to include some of that right now, and then I'll say farewell. This is Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. I'm David Horton, your guest host, as we talk about the buffalo. Clay, can you talk a little bit about what role Buffalo Bill Cody played in all of this process with the buffalo. So Buffalo Bill William Cody became Buffalo Bill in a contest to see who could shoot the most number of buffalo in a single day. So think of how just fundamentally deplorable that is, but he won uh, 400, I believe. He became the Buffalo Bill. And the Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which began in 1883 in North Platte, Nebraska, is how America understood the West. And there were some photographs and there were articles in Century Magazine and Scribner's and so on. But for most people, they their West was what they saw in Buffalo Bill. New York City, you know, Madison Square Garden, went to London, Queen Victoria attended. Uh, they, went, they performed in the Colosseum in Rome, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. He was an international celebrity. And he had b buffalo, and he had Native Americans, and, and including Black Elk and Sitting Bull, who participated in the Wild West. He, buffalo Bill was a really, really interesting man. He played a role. Now, he, he didn't help to save the buffalo per se, but he helped to create a national fascination with the buffalo that, that then it went on to encourage the salvation of, of, of the species. And so, you know, today we have Instagram and documentary films and television series and high-quality photography and high-quality video. If you were in, in let's say, Boston um, in 1885, you weren't going to the Great Plains. You were never going to see a buffalo, probably not even in a zoo. Maybe, but probably not. Suddenly, the Wild West comes to town, and you see this creature uh, and you see Native Americans. And it, so it created a kind of a, a groundswell of popular interest in the frontier that otherwise wouldn't have existed. There is a story that on one of the train trips, a number of, there was a train wreck and a number of Buffalo Bills, Buffalo died and on another occasion there, a disease ran through his herd. So it, it's not all good news, but but he was a serious guy. You know, we tend to look a little bit askance at him as if he's sort of a cousin to P.T. Barnum. That's not fair. Roosevelt knew Buffalo Bill. They met once, and, and they kind of circled around each other because Roosevelt, of course, I'm sure, had a condescending view of Buffalo Bill, a mere, a mere showman, and, buff, and they both had gigantic personalities, um, and they both loved the American West, but they never became friends. I think because Roosevelt felt that Buffalo Bill was a was a, was a kind of a huckster, which is which is not fair. I've done a lot of work around the Buffalo Bill Cody Center in Cody, Wyoming, and if anyone who's listening has never been there, it is worth a visit. It is one of the great uh, museum complexes in the country. It's largely about Buffalo Bill, but not entirely. Definitely legends in America. And a fascinating part. And I, I like the piece where you talked about the fascination because that's such a crucial component to conservation, to tourism, to the modern 
way that we look at parts of our nation. Without that level of fascination, the things aren't necessarily kept alive and kept preserved, and so a very important role. David, you're, you couldn't be more right. So th- I think of the snow leopard. Now, I've never seen a snow leopard, uh, but I've read about them, and I read about them in Peter Matheson's book, which came out a quarter of a century ago. And before that, I, I frankly didn't know that such a creature existed. Now I've seen some documentaries. They're incredibly elusive, so what they do is put up these cameras high up in the in the foothills of the Himalayans, and the cameras are motion detected. Once in a while, a snow leopard crosses through, and you see it. But they're one of the most magnificent of all creatures, and they're being saved because of the attention that was brought to them by a gifted writer like Peter Matheson and by documentary filmmakers. You can never underestimate the capacity of, of, of media to call attention to something for good or for ill, you know, I, I, I say again about Ken Burns, he has his critics. I'm not one of them. He's done more to bring history alive than anybody. And, you know, when I think of the Civil War, I see Shelby Foote holding forth in his gentle Southern way, and I hear David McCullough's voice. And, and that was the first time I became aware of the Ken Burns effect of the way that he can sensuously explore a still photograph, and as you know, on on if you buy a Mac, it, it comes with the Ken Burns effect. It's just, it just part of i iMovie, because he's you know he's that important, and so th- these are really important things, and and that, and that goes back to Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt wrote forty books; they're extremely well written, actually. Uh, he was a gifted writer, and he called attention to the frontier. He called attention to bighorn sheep, and to the mountain goat and to uh, the, the, the Bighorn Mountains and the Badlands of, of Dakota. And by doing so, he and uh, Frederick Remington, who was his friend, and Owen Wister, who was his friend, that trio, in many respects, David, created the myth of the West. If you don't, uh, we would have had some version of it, but when you think of Marlboro Man or Gunsmoke, and if you think of Clint Eastwood in Rawhide, these are late versions of a of a mythos that was created. It's based on the truth. I mean, Roosevelt was a cowboy. He he was a rancher. There was you know, there were fights between the ranchers and the nesters, the homesteaders, based on some facts, but it was a short period between, say, 1870 and 1905, uh, maybe not even that long, and it, it grew into one of the most endearing and, and pervasive myths of American culture. And Roosevelt played a key role in that, as did his friends Remington and Wister. And when Wister wrote the first great Western, The Virginian, he dedicated it to Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a chapter set in Medora, North Dakota in the Badlands. It has no particular reason to be in this book. He just did it because Roosevelt was his pal. And so, you know, the, the, the effect of this, I, I, another one is that Kit Carson, when he was, he saved he, he tried to save a white woman who was a captive um, by natives in the Southwest. He, he didn't. But when he got into the, the their abandoned campground, their abandoned campsite, and all the stuff they had to leave behind when they were when they were overtaken by angry natives, there was a dime novel about Kit Carson. So he's he goes into a like what would you if you went into West Virginia tomorrow, and you found like a a book about you that you didn't even know existed about the great David Horton. He, he, Kit Carson goes into this thing trying to rescue a white woman and finds a dime novel about himself. So the, the mythology was coexistent, was, was was catching up with the actual events on the frontier. It's, it's fabulous stuff. You can't make it up. I think it's fascinating because elevating passion encourages exploration and discovery. And that's what so much of this is all about. As people get excited, they want to know more. They want to continue to explore and continue to develop. For everyone listening, I urge them, of course, to watch the Ken Burns film. And if you want to be in the drinking game, you know, call me. But go see a bison somewhere, and preferably in a national park. Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota has them. Uh, Yellowstone has the largest herd. I have cabins right there at Cook City. And when I, I go out into Lamar Valley, which is the largest freestanding herd, of bison in the world now until the American Prairie Reserve. Look up American Prairie Reserve and contribute to it if you agree that it's an incredibly important thing for us to do at this time when we're kind of rethinking 
a lot of the ways in which we oppressed landscapes and peoples and, 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 and other species in the American West. In other words, that era is not over, David. We, you can still have access to this. You can go camp. Well, I'm going to camp tomorrow night in my Airstream in the north unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park, and I promise you that I, uh, buffalo will wander through this campground, and they'll be like three feet away from my trailer. I hate to call an Airstream a trailer. My luxury Airstream, and and they'll be right there. I mean, so that for us out here in the West, it's very real. It's incredible. And last word I'll say is my my friend Frank, who's the scout for the Listening to America series, tells me that there is a herd in the in the Henry Mountains in Utah, but there is a small bison herd there. So now I'm going there this winter, and we're going on a quest because they're very elusive. We're going on a quest to see these free range bison in the Henry Mountains. So I don't want to seem as if I have a monomania about bison because I certainly don't. I do believe that it's an indicator species. It tells you about the health of the civilization that didn't extinct them and does want them to recover and believes that they have a place and wants Native Americans to be able to reconnect in a big way with this unbelievable creature. Thank you, my friend. This has been Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. Thank you for joining us. Such interesting conversation. I really enjoy working with David Horton. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Ken Burns. There's only one Ken Burns. I wish I knew more subjects so that I could be in more of his films. This one owes a lot to David, uh, to Dayton Duncan, who's been fascinated by the American West ever since he first ventured out here uh, long, long, long ago. Uh, they've been work partners uh, for many years, and so this is as much Dayton Duncan's project as it is Ken Burns, but it has the unmistakable stamp of Ken Burns' genius. So let's go to the program. If you can contribute and help what we're doing, gas cards, ranches, memberships to KOAs and other um, RV sites, uh, whatever you can do to help us uh, in this great initiative, Listening to America, helping to fund the Edward S. Curtis Elders Project, following along as I do the Travels with Charlie journey next year. Uh, in any way that you can participate, tell your friends, and help uh, would be deeply deeply appreciated. So let's go to the show. Good day, friends, and welcome once again to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. I'm David Horton. I'm proud to be your guest co-host today. And joining me is renowned humanities scholar and host of Listening to America, Clay Jenkinson. Clay, how are you, my friend? It's good to see you, David Horton, my friend from Radford University in Virginia. Yes, indeed. And, and we're doing this across the nation using the wonderful technology that is afforded to us today. But it is fabulous to see you, my friend. And exciting news. I understand the brand new Ken Burns film about the buffalo is coming up in mid-October. And someone we know very well is going to be featured. You've, you've got a role in the film. You're, they're going to be talking with you. Can we talk a little bit about that today? Of course. This is, I think, my fifth or maybe sixth Ken Burns film that I've been so blessed to be a talking head in. You know, the thing about Ken Burns is that he can call anyone on earth and that person is almost certainly going to say yes to an interview. So that he would allow me to be in his films is surprising and delightful because... If he wants George Will, he gets George Will. Um, if if he wants President Obama, he gets President Obama. So that I get to be in uh, his films is a is just like a total joy for me. Well, I think it's exciting, and I've always enjoyed your insight and commentary as part of his films. And I think he recognizes that you bring a unique perspective, uh, that you've not only studied these subjects, but you've lived them in a lot of ways. And right now, with what you've been doing as you, you look to travel across parts of the country, as you're looking to do some different things with this program, Listening to America and all the ancillary things associated with it, you're getting to experience some of these things you're talking about in the program on the buffalo. But I'm excited to talk about that. So let, let's talk a little bit. Buffalo or bison? What is the definition? What is the distinction? For those of us that are uninformed, of course. <laughs> well, everyone calls them by both names. Buffalo is the common name. 
it's universally used except by mammologists and, and scientists. The technical name is bison. It is not a buffalo. It's not genetically related to the buffalo that one sees in Asia and in Africa. But it has been buffalo from the beginning of American life. And Ken Burns did not choose to call it his film on bison. That might have been a little off-putting to even PBS viewers. So we can agree on buffalo. Bison, bison is the Linnaean technical term. Well, there's such a American connection to the buffalo. Obviously, that's what this film is all about and, and how they influenced so much of the development of our nation, the, the life of Native Americans. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, we came really close to losing the buffalo entirely. Uh, they came close to extinction. Can you reflect on that just a little bit and, and share what you know? Certainly. I first saw a buffalo when I was seven or eight years old. I grew up in Dickinson, North Dakota, a little town of 13,000 people, just 35 miles from Theodore Roosevelt National Park. So Theodore Roosevelt National Park was created in 1947. It was at first a memorial park. It was a memorial park until I was 13 or 14 years old, and then it graduated into full national park status, but it had a small herd of bison, and we would go out on a Sunday maybe to wander around the park, and I saw buffalo then. Of course, they're magnificent creatures and ideally evolved for the American Serengeti, for the Great Plains. I'm a Lewis and Clark scholar, as you know, and Lewis and Clark were astonished by buffalo. Lewis says at the Great Falls in 1806 on the return journey, that he looked out into this valley and saw maybe 20,000 at one view. And he said, you know, their numbers are essentially infinite. And Clark, on his return journey, was on the Yellowstone River, and he would say, like on a Tuesday, today I saw the most number of buffalo I've ever seen. And then two days later he'd say, no, today I've seen the most number. And he eventually said, I'm not going to write about this anymore because it's tedious and no one would believe it. And so estimates are... David, that at the time of Lewis and Clark, there may have been as many as 35 or even 50 million of these majestic creatures. And through systematic slaughter, wanton, indifferent, cruel, meaningless slaughter, they were brought to the brink of extinction by about 1885. And if it hadn't been for the heroic work of a number of people, including Theodore Roosevelt, they would have gone extinct. And in fact, everybody who wrote about this, George Bird Grinnell and Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt and others, recognized that they would go extinct. And, and Roosevelt, in one of his books on the Badlands, he wrote three, says, it's a sad thing. I, I hate to see this happen. It's um, They're magnificent. But he said that they are effectively incompatible with civilization. And so if that's the price of civilization, then I suppose we have to pay that price. Well, fortunately... We've managed to have both. Uh, there are now about 600,000 buffalo in North America, so they're out of danger. But 600,000 compared to 50 million? It's incredible. And, of course, I, I want to talk a little bit more about President Roosevelt and his reflection on the buffalo and how the buffalo almost became our national symbol as far as he was concerned. Uh, but, you know, it is fascinating. Um, I have tried to learn a little bit more as people even in our region have raised buffalo and provided buffalo meat uh, to provide steaks and, and hamburger type meats and things like that. But it's fascinating because, you know, typically most of our red meat comes from cows and cows simply wouldn't exist anywhere close to the numbers if they would exist much at all if it weren't for people. Buffalo are a different story. Buffalo, I think, would be here regardless and, in fact, would probably be here in much greater numbers. And I, I think that's something that the documentary likely will touch on is they predated us and will likely be a part of things if we don't drive them to extinction at some point. But can we talk a little bit about President Roosevelt, his reflection on, on Buffalo and what he saw as their connection to the American spirit, to this continent, and, and to our, really, our existence? Roosevelt was a really extraordinary human being. He came out to the badlands of Dakota Territory at the age of 24 to kill a buffalo. That was his purpose. And he was able to get here because of the Northern Pacific Railroad. In other words, he wouldn't have been able to get to North Dakota if he'd had to take a wagon across the 
prairies in a steamboat up the Missouri. So the the train got him there to a little town called Little Missouri, right across from the new town called Medora on in the heart of the Badlands. And he hired a guide. He spent a long time trying to get his first buffalo. There were almost none around. On the September 20th, 1883, he got a buffalo, and he did, <laughs> excuse the political incorrectness, but he did a, an Indian war dance. He whooped around the carcass and went into all these uh, Rooseveltian ceremonials. He spontaneously took a $100 bill out of his wallet and gave it to his guide, which was an enormous amount of money then, well, and now too. And the next day he came back and hacked off its head and took it back to New York. And it had it mounted, and it's it's still there in the north room at Sagamore Hill, his his estate uh, at Oyster Bay on Long Island. And then he thought, as Roosevelt always did, well, what about my sons, and what about their sons and grandsons? Will they be able to come get their buffalo? Because Roosevelt regarded killing a buffalo as sort of a rite of passage that a real man would do. Davy Crockett would do that. Daniel Boone would do that. And so he thought that this is a way to prove that you're really part of the lingering American frontier. And he wanted future sons of himself and others to be able to come have this rite of passage. So he thought, we've got to conserve this thing or it will go extinct. And so he partnered with a man named William Hornaday, and they became two of a number of people who wound up saving the buffalo. But you know, if you know anything about hunting, you know, we have Ducks Unlimited and Pheasants Forever. It's these hunters who often supply the will and the money to preserve, to conserve these big game animals like tigers and rhinoceroses and so on. And so Roosevelt was part of, of that movement. But he believed that the bison, the buffalo, was the quintessential American quadruped. If anything symbolized America as opposed to, say, France or Germany or Italy, it was the buffalo. And so he had a kind of deep romantic attraction to this creature. It seems like a little paradox to us, doesn't it, David, that he had a romantic attachment and he was a big game hunter who killed a lot of animals in the course of his life. But he did not see that as a contradiction. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, it's ironic to me to have such reverence and respect for this magnificent beast so you can kill it. <laughs> so you can show how uh, how manly you are to be able to, to kill this beast. But fascinating that he recognized that this unique creature really represented America in so many ways. It becomes, of course, the uh, icon on the nickel, the buffalo head nickel. That was done by James Earl Frazier, who is a really, really interesting American sculptor uh, who sculpted the Roosevelt group at the American Museum of Natural History that has now been retired. He also did the famous image of the end of the trail of the Native American slumped over the front of his horse. There is something to this, of course, this paradox. But, you know, the other day I was taking my new Airstream, newsflash, newsflash, my new Airstream into storage, and I drove it six miles north of Bismarck to the storage facility, and the man who gave me the bay, he is a hunter, and, and we were going through paperwork, and I said, what, you know, he said, I just got back from Canada last night. When I asked about it, he said, yeah, I was up there, and I was able to get an elk. I thought, okay, well, this seems a little early for elk season. He said, oh, no, with a bow. And I said, wait a minute, you killed an elk with a bow how many shots? He said, well, one, of course. So in other words, the point I'm making, David, is that there's hunting and there's hunting. So there's a lot of wanton hunting that goes on. You know, in North Dakota and Montana and Wyoming, people on the first day of hunting go out at dawn and get their deer within 12 minutes and spend the rest of the day drinking. That's not the spirit of Theodore Roosevelt. It has to be sport. It has to involve uh, studying the habitat and, 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 the, and the valley where you're going to harvest the animal. There's a sort of a spiritual dimension to this that you have to sort of think like an elk or think like an elephant or think like a buffalo to get one. I don't want to romanticize this, but we can't understand hunting at its best unless we understand that it did have a, a deep spiritual element for those who really practiced it in its finest form. Well, and I think, too, looking at the era, it was essential, if you, especially if you were living in the frontier, to know how to hunt, how to 
protect you and your family from animals at times, but also to provide meat, some material for potential warmth and all the things that the buffalo and, and similar creatures provided. I would like to continue in this discussion and talk a little bit more about conservation But right now, I believe we need to take a quick pause. This is Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. Good day, friends. This is Listening to America with your host, Clay Jenkinson. I'm David Horton, and I'm serving as guest co-host for this program as we discuss the American Buffalo. Clay, you had started to talk a little bit in our discussion about Roosevelt, about his good friend, William Hornaday. Can we talk about him? Who was William Hornaday and what role did he play in the conservation of the buffalo? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've written about this. I have a, I co-edited a book with a man named Char Miller of Pomona College. It's called Theodore Roosevelt, Naturalist in the Arena, a book about hunting and conservation and Roosevelt's advocacy of international protocols about proper hunting, the the creation of the Boone and Crockett Club, which required a sport hunting, not wanton killing, what Roosevelt sometimes called game butchery. And I have an article in it on William Hornaday. He was born in 1854 uh, in the Midwest. He lived till 1937. And although many people helped to save the buffalo, including Native Americans, he probably is the most important single figure. He worked at the National Museum of the Smithsonian, And he realized in the early 1880s that buffalo were probably going to become extinct and that the National Museum did not have a buffalo exhibit. He found a few sort of mangy pelts in the basement and some bones and skulls. So he was uh, encouraged by Spencer Baird of the Smithsonian to come out to the West and see if he could get some for display. And so he came out in 1886 to Mile City, Montana. Well, what happened, David, is when he got out to Mile City, he was told there aren't any left. It's, they're gone. And he traveled northwest of Mile City into this really, the heart of this really wild country. It's wild to this day. And he said he saw hundreds of carcasses. Everywhere he turned, there were carcasses and rotting bones and horrified him. It seemed like a, I use these terms carefully, it was a holocaust. And he couldn't understand what possessed the frontiersmen and others to just slaughter this thing because they weren't using it. They would cut out a tongue or cut out some hump meat or cut out some ribs or maybe take the pelt. But essentially they were just shooting them to get rid of them. And it wasn't American Indian policy to destroy the buffalo. It was never an overt policy, but it was a tacit understanding that if you want to pacify the natives of the Great Plains, the way to do it is to pull their economy out from under them. And for people who are listening to this who are not that familiar with this story, I just want to digress for a minute, David. So the buffalo was, for natives, food. It was pelts. You know, their teepees were made out of buffalo skins. Their their luggage, their parfleshes were hardened skin of buffalo. They used the buffalo's hooves to make a kind of a glue They took the stomach and and turned it into kind of a kettle. They made their bows and arrows, the sinew of them, from parts of the buffalo. They used the skulls of dead buffalo as ceremonial and sacred objects. There was no part of the bison that they didn't harvest, and they understood that it was the keystone. So of their economy, so for us to understand it, it's, it's like your house and your car and your grocery store all wrapped into one 2,000 pound critter. So David, if you kill all or most of the buffalo, you essentially pull the rug out from the entire Native American economy, including their metaphysics, their religious, their spiritual lives. And so for them, the loss of the buffalo was a existential catastrophe. To white people, it was the necessary elimination of a nuisance and way to pacify Native people. And so, you know, on almost every Indian reservation in in the West, there are herds now of bison. This is essential to the recovery of the cultures of the Lakota, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Crow, the Nez Perce, the Blackfeet, and so on. I think we white people have to really strain our imagination to understand the symbolic importance of this slaughter. And we all have heard the stories of people traveling on the railroads, and the railroad would stop, and and hunters, people would take guns and shoot bison from the train and just leave them 
to rot out on the Great Plains. And so when when Hornaday and Roosevelt converged on the Great Plains in, in the Dakota-Montana corridor in 1886 without knowing each other yet, they both were astonished by the drawdown, and they both felt something, if possible, something should be done to save this critter. And, you know, it's remarkable that that was, in so many cases, the way the West was conquered, the way that people chose to conduct themselves. Uh, really incredible because the buffalo, as you said, was so essential to the Native American way of life in every way, shape, and form. Native Americans and their role with not only the extinction of the buffalo, but ultimately the conservation of the buffalo. Can we talk about that just a little bit and how through people like Roosevelt and Hornaday and and others who were like-minded, we were able to turn this around? Yes, so I want to be careful here, David. So I'll be very eager to see how Ken Burns handles this. He has to face this issue. I've been mentioning William Hornaday, a white man from the Midwest. Theodore Roosevelt, an enormously powerful white man from New York and Long Island. Gifford Pinchot, George Bird Grinnell. These were white people, and they played an essential role in the saving of the buffalo from extinction. Native Americans played a role, too. But the evidence of that is not great. We know that some people up along the Canadian border in the Flathead world, the Salish world of of what's now northwestern Montana, played a role in keeping a small herd alive that was crossing the border back and forth, and that this became one of the seed stocks of the recovery of the buffalo. But Native Americans at this time were so crushed by the military-industrial might of America, of the United States. They didn't have as much agency in the salvation of the buffalo as one would expect or even hope. And I'm going to say this carefully. It's important to acknowledge the centrality of the buffalo to Native Americans and that they played a significant role in in the salvation. But the fact is that most of the work was done by non-natives. And so I'm sure Ken Burns will make the most of the native input that he can. And he, I know some of the, the talking heads who are extraordinary Native Americans who will talk about the importance of the buffalo to their cultures then and now. But the salvation was by largely by the conquistadors. Well, and it makes sense because when you don't have the power position, when you don't have the ability to do these things as Native Americans, as you mentioned, were incredibly disadvantaged in terms of their military might, in terms of what was happening to their to their nations, to their their areas, the the places where they lived, it's very hard to conduct a conservation program uh, and still have the need that was there uh, with the buffalo as part of their way of life. You're essentially reinventing your entire way of life. I think it is fascinating that this buffalo represents so much of the American spirit, but also so much of the American challenge, whether it be through wanton killing, misunderstanding, a desire to undermine an existing group of people, a desire to do what you thought was best with your God-given right to explore this this grand continent, that we've experienced all these things, that, that we've gone through this. And, and I think addressing this is addressing the American experience of the 17 and 1800s as, as we move through. I'd like to go back a little bit to Roosevelt and, and some of the epiphanies that he had with the buffalo and with the West and and truly as conservation goes. I don't think that can be understated because without him at that moment, we might have gone past the point of no return. How Roosevelt was the right man at the right time and how that influenced our development of the West. I, I think about your, your discussion with the national parks as well, and all of that is one big picture. Yeah, it's a great question, David. So you have the coming to America of these property-loving, ambitious Europeans who operate by a different operating system than Native peoples. I mean, fundamentally different way of seeing life, certainly a different way of seeing the land and other creatures and other species. And then you add to that the Industrial Revolution, the amazing firepower that white people had with their Sharps rifles and Remingtons and so on. And then you add to that the coming of the railroad. You have a juggernaut. You've built this kind of juggernaut, a very self-satisfied juggernaut that believes that there's a manifest destiny for white people to 
absorb all of the waste places of the earth and transform them into civilization. And, and so that juggernaut is going to wreak unbelievable havoc on the West. And think of it, so we have the near extinction of the buffalo and other creatures like the passenger pigeon. The grizzly bears are hunted almost to extinction. Wolves are extirpated from almost every zip code in the New World. Native peoples are crushed and put on temporary holding zones called reservations, assuming that they will either disappear or be absorbed by assimilation into the larger white population. Their children are taken from them and they're transformed into white Indians, American Indians of the white sort at boarding schools around the country. And so this is America. And if you add one more element to this, the testosterone that came from the Civil War. So you have all these people who have like Custer and George Crook and Sheridan and Sherman who have built up this really deep fund of of sheer violent testosterone in this struggle for our national identity. You put all that together and the bison doesn't have a chance. So here's why Roosevelt is so great and so important. He realized, oh, we're skinning the West. There'll be no timber left if the government doesn't step in. We're overgrazing the grasslands of America. There's going to have to be some regulatory activity. We're going to have to at least bring justice to the reservation so that the agents aren't corrupt and cronyist and skimming the rations and so on. And so, as you know, Roosevelt became an accidental president, and in seven years and 121 days, he set aside 230 million acres of the public domain as National Park, National Monument, National Forest, National Game Preserve, National Bird Sanctuary. Nobody has ever done more than Theodore Roosevelt did, and he realized that this paradigm that we have is an amazing thing, but it has a dark side, and he recognized that and said, we have to pull back a little bit, and we have to preserve some of the greatest places, and we have to preserve the bison, and his achievement is incalculably large, and we're seeing it today you know, we're beginning to pull down a few of the dams in the Pacific Northwest. And we realize that in a certain way, that industrial, concrete, petroleum, military complex, a mighty engine in some ways went too far. And we can safely pull back a little and allow some other things to exist and coexist on the North American continent. And if, if anybody ever understood that, it was Theodore Roosevelt. And not only did he understand it, but he wasn't wringing his hands by writing books. He made it happen because he got control of the levers of power in the United States, and he expanded the executive authority beyond any president up to his time, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. An incredible story, and, and I think it's really a quintessential part of the American story, as I don't think people intended to create the issues and the hazards and the problems. Many times it was perhaps a misunderstanding, but having the right leadership at the right time that can see this resource and see the challenges and the opportunities and the things that need to be done, it really is that intersection of challenge, leadership, opportunity, and the future. A fascinating piece. And we've talked a lot about the history of where we've come, how the the buffalo almost came to extinction. Let's talk about the buffalo today. Can we talk about the American Prairie Reserve in Montana? Yes, of course. So if I leave my home here in Bismarck with or without my new Airstream, I can drive and in less than two hours I can see a buffalo. So how far would you have to go to see a buffalo, David? Well, uh, as I said, I think we have some in a neighboring county here in Virginia where people are raising them. Uh, so it's a little bit different. They're not wild buffalo. They are farmed. Um, Floyd County, Virginia, actually the mascot of their local sports teams is the buffalo. And there is a buffalo mountain in Floyd County. And so there's a piece of that in right here in southwest Virginia. But yes, you can see buffalo in, in different places, but to see wild native buffalo, this preserve is really an essential place. Exactly. So the American Prairie Reserve, headquartered in Bozeman, is a nonprofit whose vision is to create a gigantic buffalo pasture in east central Montana. This is one of the most lightly populated places in 
America, and the American Prairie Reserve is working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies and Native American reservations or tribes to knit together maybe a 3.5 million acre buffalo commons. It's an amazing concept. And so what happens is when ranches come up for sale, the American Prairie Reserve goes to the rancher and says, if you want to sell it to your nephew or your children, we'll, we won't get in the way. But if you're putting it on the market, we intend to compete for it and we're going to pay top price to, to buy it. And then they remove the fences and they're knitting together this, this parcel. They have several thousand buffalo now and their goal is 35,000 and here's the thing about it David if they can achieve this vision there will be buffalo that can spend their entire lives without ever butting up against a fence and that's how buffalo are meant to be now this I should say is a it's a it's an incredible story and the American Prairie Reserve it's it's so beautifully managed and enlightened that it's astonishing they work with existing ranchers to help uh, market their product. They are very respectful of the ranch community. They are working closely with Native Americans in co-management. They thought this through. This is not just a bunch of rich people coming in and thinking, oh, look what we can do. I have deep admiration for it, and I hope they succeed because it would be a, an international spectacular destination from all over the world to come and see this. It, America still has that, that gigantic mythological presence in the world community. For all that's gone wrong with America, America still represents something. And they love, of course, Europeans love Native Americans on the frontier and the, the, the westward movement and all of those things, David. So I hope they succeed. But I want to say that what they're doing is controversial because many of the heritage ranchers out there and the people that live in these communities are like, okay, here come some extremely rich people in their private jets. They come out here and they buy up property at premium prices that we can't afford to compete with. And they seem to have no particular respect for the heritage that we've been here for six generations. We've lived here through blizzards. We've lived here through droughts. We pull calves in the middle of the night during a blizzard. You know, we're, we're fixing fence on a 105 degree day out in the middle of nowhere. We came, we stuck. And now here come billionaires from Massachusetts or California, and they bring their arrogance and, out, and, they, and they think they know better what Eastern Montana needs than we do. So I disagree with that view, David, but I respect it. And so does the American Prairie Reserve, but you see the problem. But I also feel I've met some of these ranchers. My view is willing buyer, willing seller. You know, if, if someone wants to sell their ranch to the American Prairie Reserve, that's the American system. But I get it. I get their feeling that they are themselves on the brink of extinction as a you know, as, as sort of what we think of when we think of the cowboy and the rancher. Well, I think it's complicated because you have similar but different paths that you're traveling with that, you know, working to preserve the buffalo, preserve the, the prairie as it once existed and not have it have a requirement that it make money, that it be self-sustaining, that it it be an income source for the folks that own it. Uh, that's a really crucial part. And that's always a balance. You know, that's the argument with the national parks as well. There are some who say we, we should divest the nation of the national parks and all the conservation land and put it into private hands and allow people to do what they will with it. I think that's the challenge that we run into. But, um, you know, one of the, the pieces that I reflect on with that is there's room for both. Imagine you're in a hot air balloon dropped into Montana in 1805. What do you see? Tens of thousands of bison, and there are wolves following the herd, and there are grizzly bears in, in the thickets, and there are elk and mule deer, and the grasses are all native, and there are eagles and other raptors in the sky, and there are Native Americans living a traditional life way on this land, living lightly, not, not um, d drawing down any of these resources. He said it was American Serengeti. And there's room, I think, David, for a little patch of that in our time. You paint a beautiful picture of the prairie. We need to take another break right now, but this is Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson.
Welcome back to Listening to America with your host, Clay Jenkinson. Today, we're having a fascinating discussion about the buffalo, the American experience, and all entailed. Clay, you have a wonderful story, I think, about their meeting in 1886. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so William Hornaday came out to get specimens for the Smithsonian. And Roosevelt was here to kill his buffalo. He'd come in 1883, but he was still playing cowboy and rancher in Dakota. So they were about 150 or so miles apart, had never met. But they're both kind of wonderfully tuned into the frontier ethos. So eventually, Hornaday gets his bison. He kills more than 30, and he takes them back to uh, Washington, D.C. He's an experimental and gifted taxidermist, and he creates this magnificent diorama. It's a glass box, and there are six bison in it. And he brought back tufts of grass and some soil, and he brought back buffalo chips, you know, the manure of the of bison. So he tried to create the most realistic glass box habitat for these bison that he could. And it was mounted at the Smithsonian. It stayed there until the 1950s. It's and a magnificent. I've seen photographs of it. Roosevelt first came to the Badlands of Dakota Territory in 1883, David, and he got his buffalo, but he came back in 1884, 1885, 1886, and he he really, this was one of the most formative periods of his life. He later said he would never have been president had it not been for his time in North Dakota. Anyway, Hornaday gets his bison. He's creating this glass box. It's going to be his masterpiece, and so he has curtains around the, the glass box as he's working in it because no one's allowed to see it. He's, he's like Michelangelo at the Sistine Chapel. No one can see the development of this diorama. And one day, close to the completion date of this, he hears somebody rustling around outside those curtains, and he's thinking, what's going on? And the guy says, I wonder what sort of rifle this man used to get these bison. And he thinks, who is this clown? And then he hears, a, I would really want to know where he got them, because, of course, I got mine in, out in Dakota Territory just three years ago. He rips open the curtains in exasperation to figure out who's this person. And, of course, it's Theodore Roosevelt, and they become friends. Roosevelt says, you know, what's your goal here? And he actually, Roosevelt knows some of the ranchers from the ranches where Hornaday got the bison. So he becomes a huge Hornaday advocate, helps him get the gig as the director of the Washington, D.C. Zoo and later the Bronx Zoo, and they form a kind of partnership to see if they can save this creature. Hornaday does most of the heavy lifting, but Roosevelt lends his name and prestige to it, and Hornaday creates this foundation, and by 1930, they dissolve the foundation because the buffalo are out of the woods. There, there aren't a lot of them. There are tens of thousands now, but, but they're no longer going to go extinct. And so this this meeting, I find just utterly delightful. And I would give anything to have been in the Smithsonian on the day that these two extraordinary men met and how, how annoying Roosevelt can be until you decide how great Roosevelt is. Well, it's fascinating that he was so interested that they were able to have this serendipitous meeting and go from there. You mentioned the display. Where's Hornaday's display today? So they decommissioned it at the Smithsonian in the 1950s. And when they pulled it, David, the most amazing thing happened. They Under the floorboard, where it had been for, you know, 80, 75 years, they found a little metal cash box, and they opened it up, and Hornaday says, gives a little account of where they came from and says, please don't destroy these. Whatever else happens, please don't destroy these creatures. And so they didn't, and they decided to deaccession them, so they offered them to Montana, to, to Montana State, at Bozeman, and, the, and and Montana State took them, but la- they didn't know what to do with them. They were later dispersed, and one wound up in the lobby of an insurance company in Helena and so on. Anyway, in the 1980s or 90s, a, a, a gifted amateur from uh, Montana gathered them all up, found all of them, and he brought them to Fort Benton, where there's an agricultural museum, and he recreated the scene. There's no glass, but he, he put them in the postures that they're supposed to be in and in relation to each other. I've been there. But they did not disappear is the answer to your question. And and if you get to Fort Benton, which is the, the head of navigation on the Missouri River, there they are. Well, it's wonderful that we have that opportunity to preserve these things, to keep them around so that folks can continue to be inspired. But speaking of inspiration, you've had some personal encounters with buffalo, I believe. Can we talk about that just a little bit? Can you share some of your stories with the buffalo? 
Well, as I said, I first saw them when I was seven or eight years old, and of course, you just you're just overwhelmed with awe that such a creature exists. They're huge, they're shaggy, they're placid, they're very gentle until you rile them up. Probably 150 of them now in in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Then when I've hiked the Little Missouri River, which starts at Devil's Tower and comes all the way to West Central North Dakota, I've hiked it in its entirety twice. And on the second journey, I was it was a hot, the hottest summer in North Dakota history, and I was I was hiking through Theodore Roosevelt National Park on about the twelfth day, and I came on this this herd of about thirty, I suppose, or forty bison just grazing in this in this pasture in this valley. Normally, I would have walked a long way around that small cluster of of creatures because they can be dangerous, and every year people get gored by them in in Yellowstone National Park. But I, <laughs> this will tell you either that this is a true story or I'm a complete idiot or both. But I decided I've been out here. I've been sleeping on the ground. I've been listening to the coyotes. I've been observing the river, walking through it 10 or 15 times a day. I, I'm, I'm in the groove. I'm in the zone here. I could walk to the North Pole. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to stroll through this herd and see what happens. Because I had a backpack on, so I thought I'd survive if one attacked me. You know, I could sort of hide under it. But I thought, I'm just going to stroll through here. And now when I think about it, I realize what an insane thing it was. But I was within three or four feet of of some of them, and they just kind of snorted and looked up and went back to their grazing. And I think, you know, I want to think I earned it, David. When I was, I want to think I earned it. Now, of course, I could have been page six news in the Dickinson Press, moron gored by buffalo while thinking he's in spirit of place. But on that same journey, I would wait every night for the first sound of the coyotes. And then I would I would call back. And once in a long while, I'd get a yip or a, a coyote call back. Now, they, they probably were like, hey, everyone, there's some complete idiot out here. Stay clear of him. Or, we, you know, we could gang up and just kill him. I don't know what they were saying, but I did want, on these journeys, I'm very serious about spirit of place, as you know. On these journeys, I try to exfoliate my being and become as much as one can, who's carrying a polyethylene backpack and freeze-dried food. I try to get as close to that natural world. So I'm, I'm sort of actuated in a little way by the same spirit that Roosevelt was feeling of wanting to be authentic, that this is this is something quintessentially American. So so that's the screen. I also t- once took the lieutenant governor of North Dakota and his wife and children to see a place in the Badlands, and we encountered a, a buffalo bull. The bull was just fine. It was just lying there, snorted a little. But the the spouse had a panic attack and was like, this is the, you know, the last day of our lives you you've killed you've killed us what have you done how dare you get us out of here and i do believe that her panic affected the the buffalo and i think the buffalo kind of got stirred up a little too nothing happened it stayed 50 yards away but the point i'm making is that the spirit you bring to something affects the things around you the buffalo is a very amazing creature and it could sense our fear I think. But if we had just been like, okay, we can probably just leave this creature alone and it'll leave us alone. That certainly wasn't her her style. We are all connected. And yes, you're right. We we all have a vibe. For the last 25 years, you and Ken Burns have had a connection. You've been a content expert to talk with him as he's explored some things through his films. How did the participation in the Buffalo film come about? Uh, did Ken call you up one day and say, hey, Buffalo, what do you know? So it's been one of the great joys of my life to have the opportunity to work with Ken Burns. I don't use this term lightly. He's a true genius, and he's done more for America's understanding of history, the Civil War, jazz, baseball, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the national parks, uh, et cetera, than anybody. You know, he's our premier documentary filmmaker, and I've had the great joy of being asked to come and, and be interviewed by him. And it started because of my work on Jefferson, and he was doing a Jefferson documentary back in 1996, 97, and 98. And I got to be not only in it, but one of the advisors to the film. And that started this. And so every once in a while, he does a film that I either know something about or pretend to. And so so I've had this great joy. I hope I get to be in four or five more before it's all over. He's absolutely amazing. Of course, he now has an unlimited budget, essentially. And so he has an unfair advantage over 
you know, ninety-eight percent of all the other documentary filmmakers because they have to scramble to produce their films. It's fun to be in the editing booth with him. There are still photographs, and you know, he has that kind of Ken Burns effect where he, the camera moves around. And then there are video clips and film clips, and then there is period music, and then there's contemporary music, and then there are the Talking Heads. And then there is the narrative, often by Peter Coyote now, formerly by David McCullough, and other parts. So there are layers. And so they showed, like, we, we would sit and watch the entire episode, and then the episode would be an hour and 35 minutes long, and it has to be cut down to an hour, which is excruciating. I've made some documentary films myself, and, and it's just excruciating to cut. And so we're all giving our opinion, you know, there's a little more of this, a little less of that, you know. And he's kind of thinking all he's taking this seriously but then he turns to his editor and says all right we're going to shorten that clip by by three seconds but we're going to have the music come in a little bit later and that's still i don't like that still we're going to move that still into another place and we're going to put this one here and we're slowly going to move up and you're going to see jefferson's monticello sort of through the fog and i and i don't think that that music is quite at the right pace and that talking head i think that we, we might want to rethink that and get somebody else on that and bang 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 it all happens in a minute and he fixes it he fixes it. He's that good. He can intuit all these layers at once with this incredible mastery. And it's just a joy to watch him him, him do it. He, I can tell you why I get in his films. I know my material. So what, like for the Franklin film, I trained. Normally I just show up. I trained for this. I memorized stuff. I, I had notebooks. I read many books. I, I rehearsed because I so wanted to be in that film. And I got to be a big deal in that film, partly because of that. But one day we were sitting there and he said, you know why you get in my films? And I said, no. And he said, because you stick the landing. As you know, if you've ever edited, and I know you have, if someone says, well, uh, Hornaday was out there about another thing, and then he did this, and then Roosevelt came there, and then there was a National Depression, and, and then uh, Hornaday's wife left him, and, and, and then the Bronx dude fired him. You can't edit that. So the people that do it right, people like George Will, they say, William Hornaday went to the Badlands of Dakota Territory in September of 1886. Pause, pause, pause. His interest was in saving the bison from extinction. Pause, pause. And now the editor can go through and pull out any piece of that. So sticking the landing, and I've, I'm not naturally good at that, but I've learned to do it because I was there in New England to be interviewed for Franklin, and that spent weeks getting ready. Then he said, you know, we're doing Dayton, his, his partner. We're doing this Buffalo film. I think you have something to say about that. I said, yes, I do. You know, we re-rack the camera and we start talking about the bison. So I had these stories to tell about it. Then after that, I there was a little extra segment on the American Revolution film that he's going to be doing for 2026. And so by the time it's over, I'm exhausted. I go back to my hotel. And then, David, you don't know. You don't know whether, A, you're in the film at all, or if you're in the film, how much. He doesn't send you a list of questions or topics. The camera just starts and he says, tell me about the national parks. I know I'm in the Buffalo film because I'm in the trailer and I wouldn't be if I weren't in it in some other way. But I don't know if I'm in it for 30 seconds, three minutes, or 17 minutes. It's closer to three than 17. But in, within Franklin, I watched it and I had a drinking game going with a pal of mine. So I would had to take like 17 shots. Fortunately, I was using soda. But you don't know. I don't know. And then the other thing you think of when you leave, when you get on the airplane and fly back wherever you came from, you think, Jesus, that was so stupid. I didn't say that right. That was I, I, I could have said that so much better. And then I write to him and say, give me a second interview. I'll pay my own freight. I'll come. I'll, I'll wear the same clothes. Please, please allow me a second chance. Please, sir. Please, coach. And he always says, no, 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 no. And, you know, we don't really communicate directly that much. When I'm there, we do. And we go out for dinner. He has There's a restaurant that he owns. <laughs> you go for these exquisite pieces of salmon. And there are, there are all the posters of all of his films up on the wall. And the last time I was there, he said, I guess I'm going to have to get an annex here for more posters. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, he's Ken Burns. But anyway, it's just such a joy to work with him. And it's been such a... I'm fighting above my weight. You know, I'm punching... I, I, I'm in the big arena and I'm always just shocked that I'm there at all and deeply, deeply gratified. And once in a while, someone on the street will say, hey, are you that guy? And I always wonder what they mean, but it usually means they saw me in one of his films. 
Well, it's a a really neat thing to hear that that is the way that he goes about making his films because it sounds like it's more a process of discovery, much like a documentarian would do. You go out and see what you get. You may have some things in mind that you want to capture, but the story is the story. And the way people tell the story is the way that you then craft your film to tell the story. And that sounds very organic, which explains why he's been so successful. Well, and he has now this budget and a staff and a brilliant staff, and they can fan out. They go to every archive, the Denver Public Library, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, anywhere where there is a Buffalo image or a Buffalo story. And, of course, the footage. I'll, I'll give you one more quick piece about that. So Roosevelt killed his first bu- buffalo on September 20th, 1883, near Marmoth, North Dakota, which is a, a, a ghost town that's sacred to me. And I, th- that's the corridor where I've done all this hiking. Dayton Duncan, who's really the producer of this film, called me and said, we need a photograph of this place where Roosevelt killed the buffalo. Do you know where that was? And I said, sure, I can do that. He said, well, we kind of need it to be a kind of unpleasant day, kind of a rainy, uh, muddy day. And I said, well, I don't know, Dayton, you know, that you can't, you can't ask for those. You're either there or you're not. I'm not going to go spend a month out there. He said, well, you know, just send me what you have. So the next day I drove out to the Badlands with my friend Jim, and we were driving down this gravel road, North Dakota 16, to the site. And I'm one of the, I suppose, five people who knows where that site was because it's in the middle of nowhere. A tremendous rancher showed it to me once. And so I get there and it starts to drizzle. And so suddenly, I'm getting what Dayton needs. And so I took like 300,000 photographs and put them in a big Dropbox file and sent them to him. So here's my question. I'm going to be watching this on the 16th and the 17th of October. It comes right after the Theodore Roosevelt Symposium at Dickinson State University that I always uh, host every year. And so I'll be watching, and I'm going to be watching for this this photograph. And, I'll, you know, for all I know, it's not in there at all. If it's in there, nobody in the world will care but me. But if it's there... In some ways, that'll be even more satisfying than whatever stuff came out of my mouth during the interview. And, and it happened with another one, too. They were doing, this is Doris Kearns Goodwin, they were doing Theodore Roosevelt. And I took them to the Elkhorn Ranch, and it was like an unbelievable November day. And some of that footage got into the final product, and I was just so thrilled that I was able to take them to one of the most authentic of all Theodore Roosevelt places on, an, you know, it can be a bad day anywhere at any time it was another perfect day and they got a sense you know roosevelt said that in the winter in north dakota it's a time of iron desolation and i was showing them the elkhorn ranch with iron desolation now i'm proselyte i'm 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 begging doris kearns goodwin to do one of her films on lewis and clark we need it there hasn't been a lewis and clark since burns did his before the bicentennial she has the resources to do it. I'm to the point of I'm sure they're going to have a restraining order, but I write them about once every three months saying, please, 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 please do one of your docudramas on um, Lewis and Clark because it would be, it's, a, it's as great a story as there exists in the United States. Well, it sounds like you may have earned a producer or co-producer credit or co-cinematographer credit, if that works out. Uh, But, Clay, these are wonderful stories, and thank you so much for sharing. We are looking forward to seeing you, as well as all of the folks involved in the next Ken Burns film on The Buffalo, coming out mid-October 2023. Thank you, David. 